Well, good evening, LCM. Good evening. And our friends Drake and Zach and who else we got? Jeff. Yeah. Jeff's here. Come on, we got all kind of folks here tonight. Well, it's December 28th, 2023. We're nearing the end of the year on our Gregorian calendar. When you consider that the Earth is traveling 67,100 miles per hour in orbit around the sun, we're traveling at a glorifying and yet terrifying pace, aren't we? Perhaps this is why our days seem so long and our years seem so short. You know, the Earth is moving around the sun about 60 times faster than we're rotating each day. In three days' time, Andrew and Sarah will be married. In three days' time, we will all be gathered around a bonfire at the Pow Pow Ranch. If the last three decades have been any indicator, the Lord will breathe clarity and vision into us for the days ahead. I did something unusual tonight, and I asked for the opportunity to speak to you. I want to give you my perspective on the sermon series that we've been engaged in since we came back from our annual conference. And I'm going to go ahead and repent now because I lied to the pastors and I told them that the message would be 45 minutes. I have no intention of preaching a 45-minute message. So if they rush the pulpit, I'm counting on you, Carlos. Protect me. All those years of kung fu are going to come right into play. Let me show you our first slide. We've been engaged in something for 57 days. From the unapologetic Zionist all the way through the 17th message, he reigns supreme. We, we have been focused on something. This church is not big on sermon series. We've often seen them as the domain of lazy pastors that just didn't want to have to hear from God about what to speak about week after week. But the reality is, as the Lord is unveiling his plans to us, we're having to meditate on the same subjects for an extended period of time to understand it. Somebody look at that slide and consider that's a lot of ground to be covered in such a short time. So it blesses me to be in a family that is not satisfied to stay in the blatantly well-known, not satisfied to comfort ourselves with well-worn and little applied truths. Many of you in here have been through ministry training one. Some of you have been through ministry training two. You're quite aware that Israelology is foundational to understanding the Bible. More than that, it's probably the singular most neglected area of study in all of Christendom. I'm happy to say that we are not neglecting the Israel-dependent gospel or our mysterious inclusion in the biblical story. It's a difficult thing to begin to strain against the tide of historical teaching and properly transverse the biblical narrative. It's an even more difficult thing to do this in an open forum that is transparent with every member able to and encouraged to present their own findings. You know, in most churches, you don't get the opportunity to give feedback. In here, we require it. We, we value the challenge. We like what we learn from it. Remember what Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Well, LCM, we have no reason to feel ashamed on any level of our interaction with the word. We are men that are quite literally doing our very best to present ourselves to God as one approved. We boldly present our latest revelation, and we submit it before our brothers to be tested and approved. That's just exactly what Romans 16.10 says about Apelles and what we teach in our ministry training. Now, sometimes the revelation is not just tested and approved. Sometimes the scope of the revelation is actually improved, and that's our goal. Have y'all had some clarifying moments that improved your insight into the Word in the last 57 days? The title of tonight's message is No exclusionary truth. As we get into that topic tonight, let's read a passage from Acts that has defined the attitude of this family since the beginning of LCM, all the way back in 2002. Acts 17, 11. Now these Jews 
were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. This body of believers has always received the word with all eagerness and examined the scriptures daily to see if the things being presented were true. We've often valued the questions raised from a teaching more than the actual teaching. The reason that's true is because any teaching that promotes the personal and the corporate study of the word is promoting a continuing and growing relationship with the God of the word. So we're not in the business of just regurgitating well-known facts and getting you to parrot them back. Our job is to challenge and to be challenged. And in that discussion, we learn more about the God of the word. I'm satisfied that this objective has been met in our last 57 days of study in a sermon series that is really built around the centrality of Israel within the biblical text. I have to say that our timing was somewhat spirit-led and extremely fortuitous given what's going on in the world all around us. And we started it well before that was a thing. This study, this subject is the study of a lifetime. And I want to encourage you to develop it over your lifetime. Let me introduce you to our topic tonight by restating our title. No Exclusionary Truth. It might be beneficial for you to consider an approximate definition of exclusionary truth so that you can determine what it is that I'm saying we have to avoid. Here's a definition straight from the Antichrist AI. <laughs> exclusionary truth is a term used to describe a statement or a belief that is limited to only one group or particular groups of people in a way that is unfair. It is a concept that is often used in legal context, such as the exclusionary rule which prevents the government from using evidence gathered in violation of the defendant's constitutional rights. Now, you can relax. We're not going to veer from the domain of the scripture and venture into legal theory and practice. That would bore everybody in this room except Keith and a few of us that know what it is to have search and seizure that was illegal. <laughs> Yeah. In the legal field, evidence is, that is obtained illegally is usually not admissible in court, even if the evidence is true. That's not the way that we're going to use the term tonight. We're Christians. For us, all that matters is truth. This is the case even when it's been a bit of a messy and unorthodox process to come by that truth. To us, all truth is gathered and is precious and is truth. For our purposes tonight, what I mean by no exclusionary truth is that learning one true thing does not set aside another true thing. In fact, I'm just, forgive me for doing it like this, but I want you to say something with me. Learning one truth, learning one truth does, not does not set aside another truth. So I thought Pastor Judah did an amazing job reminding us of that fact last Thursday. His sermon demonstrated an incredible grasp of the word and the multifaceted truth that should be impacting each of us on a daily basis. I'm going to steal a slide from his message and discuss the principle of no exclusionary truth. Do y'all remember this one? Yeah. The kingdom is here, it is being entered, and it is yet to arrive. So Luke 17, 21, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there for behold, the kingdom of God is, somebody say is, is, is in the midst of you. Then in Luke 16, 16, the law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached and everyone forces his way into it. Then in Revelation 12, 10, and I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of the Christ have come. Yeah. Is it true that the kingdom of God is in the midst of us according to Luke 17, 21? Yes. Yeah, that answer is yes. But that truth does not exclude the truth from Luke 16, 16, which describes the kingdom as something that everyone is still forcing his way into. Additionally, 
The truth that the kingdom is in our midst and that everyone forces his way into it does not exclude the truth expressed in Revelation 12.10, which declares a point in time when the kingdom is more fully realized. In the Bible, three things can be equally true about the kingdom at all times. These truths coexist. And we're familiar with it in many areas. How many of you believe Jesus is fully God? How many of you believe he's fully human? One truth does not cancel the other truth out. Both are true at the same time. Look at this familiar slide. We're not going to read it because you ought to recognize this. And for many of you, it's written in your Bible. Let me ask you some questions about it. Is it true that you have been saved? Is it true that you are still receiving salvation? Is it true that on that final day, you will be finally saved? These three truths do not exclude one from the other. They're all true at the same time. They coexist together as truth. Are y'all following me here? There's no exclusionary truth in that. Judah illustrated this with the topic of sanctification. In fact, he did it with seven things. He did it with sanctification. He did it with our priestly status. We are priest, we are being made into priest, what we will be is priest. He did it with our being the city of God. And he even did it with the term wife or bride of God or of Christ. Each of these subjects are presented in multiple tenses in the Bible, and more than one thing is true about them at any given time. Would somebody say, no exclusionary truth? Rather than continue to restate these things, Judah already has taught you them. And if I continue on this path, I risk doing it with less eloquence and proficiency than he did. So I'm going to move on to some other topics. Let's talk about metaphors, similes, and analogies, because they all have limitations. They're often intended to convey relationships in a descriptive rather than a technically prescriptive manner. Is God described in the Bible as a father? But that metaphor is limited and does not mean that God procreated with a spouse. The Bible's kind of clear on this subject. Creation was made ex nihilo, straight out of nothing. Yeah. The metaphor is limited and it does not imply every attribute of a father. Y'all see the way in which it's limited? Is Israel frequently related to God's firstborn son in the scripture? Out of Egypt, I called my firstborn son. Yes, but that metaphor is limited and does not exclude Israel from being related in the scripture as a female, a daughter, or a bride. Normally, sons cannot be daughters as well. Normally, sons cannot be brides as well. But in the Bible, Israel can be referred to as all three because we're conveying the depth of emotion and relationship. We are not giving you a technically precise schematic to follow. Is Israel described as a daughter in the Bible? But that metaphor is limited and does not mean that Israel is not a son or a bride. Is Israel described as a vine in the Bible? Yes, but the metaphor is limited and does not exclude Israel from being a son, daughter, or bride. Now, maybe in California, somebody's going to marry a plant, but normally, Those would be exclusionary truths. In the Bible, these are not exclusionary truths. These terms are used to convey deep relational meanings that are descriptive, and they are not meant to be technically precise. Nor did God intend for you to take them that way at all. Let's get to the point. The Bible uses colorful language to convey deep meanings, and the truth conveyed in a statement like... Israel is my firstborn son, does not exclude the truth that God also relates to Israel with him as a husband and Israel as a wife. This should be common sense. But then we enter into Christendom, and everybody loses common sense over these things. My wife is described as a son of God in the Bible. Honey, do you believe on Jesus Christ? Yeah, do you love him with all your heart? Well, as as many as believed on him, he gave the right to be a son of God. That was not intended to strip her of her femininity, though. 
Yeah? I am described as a bride in the Bible. But thankfully, that does not emasculate me. Those are relational terms. These terms are used to help us understand the depth and complexity of our relationship with the Almighty. So what was our sermon series aimed at? What were those 57 days aimed at? Our sermon series was aimed at putting Israel in the center and the forefront of the redemptive story told in the Bible. This truth does not exclude the fact that individuals from other nations, nations other than Israel, are also redeemed in the story. But they were not the point of our sermon series. Yeah, our series was aimed at understanding the redemptive story that centers on Israel precisely so that you would understand the gospel as Israel dependent. This truth does not exclude the fact that you have also been mysteriously included in the story. Nowhere did we ever mean to imply that. Our series was aimed at correcting an age-old problem where we put ourselves in the center of every verse and we forget the people to whom every one of those verses was written. This truth does not exclude the fact that every verse also has meaning for you as well. You following me here? Let's get to some issues that provoked the most questions from you. And I'm arguing stirred you to greater learning. It is true. Exodus portrays only one named nation as the betrothed wife of God. That is true. You cannot find America in Exodus. You can't find Norway in Exodus. You can't find Mexico or Canada in Exodus. Israel is portrayed as the only national bride. The prophets portray only one named nation as the betrothed wife of God. Isaiah 54 calls God and is a husband to Israel. Isaiah 62 calls God a husband to Israel and the land of Israel. In fact, the whole Bible that could be likened to a wedding story is about God and Israel. This seemed to unnerve some of us. None of these truths are exclusionary of the fact that unnamed Gentile nations are also included in the imagery of the body of the groom and of the corporate makeup of the bride. Remember, these are metaphors that emphasize relationships. We're going to go see Andrew and Sarah get married. And in the reality, it's one man marrying one woman. In the metaphor, we're talking about a sevenfold, threefold, singular God that is marrying a nation of individuals as one nation. You see how metaphors kind of break down? In the Bible, to be married to more than one woman requires two women to be there. <laughs> but if God is doing the marriage, he can call an entire nation a bride. It seems that when Revelation 19 was presented with Israel as the bride and members of unnamed Gentile nations as mere wedding guests, well, you were provoked. You were provoked to study. And that's a good thing. I want you to understand something. This truth is not exclusionary. In other words, this imagery is descriptive language to convey a depth of relationship with only one named national entity. The book of Revelation names three nations. Three. Two, march against the city of God, Gog and Magog. The only named national entity that is named positively in the entire book of Revelation, is Israel. But that does not mean that members of other unnamed nations are not included in everything that we're reading about. What we're having to grapple with is that God named in advance who it is that he would redeem. He named in advance who it is that he would marry. He did not name the nations that you people came from but it does not exclude you from being a part of the entire process, whether in the groom, which is how I see it, or ultimately in the bride. Let's consider Revelation 7. Specifically, this chapter includes every nation, every 
nation, every tribe, every people, and every language present, and they are at the throne of God. But if you read Revelation 7 carefully, you're going to find out that the only named tribes are the tribes of Israel. So everybody else remains anonymous. Israel is specifically identified. Our series was designed to put this kind of observation front and center in your thoughts. The gospel is Israel dependent. And the inclusion of Gentiles is mysterious. 2,000 years of preaching have altered the way that this truth has been approached by the average Christian. And you're included in that. Our hope was to reacquaint you with the perspective of Jews and Gentiles in the first century. Before 2,000 years of making us the center of the story was preached about. Can you all appreciate that? Yeah. yeah. So brothers and sisters in this room. Since some of us were greatly disturbed in this. Specifically that we portrayed you in the wedding party and not as the, the, like a big capital T-H-E, bride. I want to address that issue. It's unfortunate because if you survey the wedding imagery in the Bible, it reveals that Israelis, Israel, national Israel, are considered both the wedding party and the bride. And that's not offensive. What I mean is that being related to the wedding party does not exclude you from being related to the bride in the Bible. Let me give you two quick examples that concern national Israelis that we know. We know they're Jews, which means they are the national bride of God, and they are described as a wedding party. John 3:28. You yourselves bear me witness. By the way, who's speaking here? John the Immerser. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. Is John the Immerser a Jew? Yes. Then he's a member of the national entity called Israel that God identified as his bride throughout the Bible. Is John relating himself to the wedding party in this passage when he says friend of the groom? Yes. yes. Then John is rightly described as the wedding party and the bride. Those two truths are not exclusive from one another. Now, in our wedding tomorrow, there will only be one bride. There will only be one groom. Yeah. The wedding party is a separate thing. But when we are describing relationships and emotional attachments and the depth of affection in a two-party covenant, God often has you play more than one role, or maybe didn't have you play a role, in the metaphor that he uses. These metaphors are used to describe emotion and relational aspects of our walk with God. They are not highly detailed prescriptive statements meant to define all that is true. Is, is Jesus called the vine in John 15? Do you look for branches on his forehead? That would be absurd. The fact that he's related to a vine does not at all mean that every other aspect of a vine is true. Can you see where some of us got a little twisted up maybe? You're like, no, I didn't, but they did. <laughs> Say it with me. No exclusionary truth. No exclusionary truth. The fact that one thing is true does not exclude something else from being true as well. Can I show you another one? Yeah. Matthew 21. We're just going to read the first few verses. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared... To a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast. But they would not come. Throughout the Bible, Israel is likened to a bride. In fact, it's the only national entity that God himself calls his bride. Yet in this parable that is being spoken to Israelis. It is Jews who are being compared to wedding guests. Do you see that? That's not because God is contradicting himself. It's because 
These two truths are not exclusive from one another. The point is that Israel is the bride, and that does not exclude Israel from also being in the wedding party. These are both metaphors. They're both in, employed to convey deep relational aspects of truth, but they should never be taken to be exclusionary from one another. Have I made that point yet? The majority of language in the Bible includes Gentiles into the union of God and man through the groom. The majority of all of the language in the Bible grafts in men from unnamed nations through their relationship to the groom, not the bride. That is not an incorrect statement. In fact, I would love to sit down with anyone who wants to go through those. It is the overwhelming majority of passages in the Newer Testament. But these are not exclusionary truths. The majority of the Bible language also defines the national people of Israel as the bride. But those two things can coexist together. In fact, I think the point of every wedding is two becoming one. Second Corinthians 11 and Ephesians 5 use bride language referring to Gentiles. It's two rare instances. But that's not the primary way that the Bible speaks of Gentiles. The bride metaphor primarily refers to Israel. But here's a really neat thing. Since those truths are not exclusionary, whether Jew or Gentile, we are rightly said to be in the body of the groom and rightly to be said within the city of God, within the temple of God, within the priesthood, and on the wedding day, one with the bride as well. See, you can see how some people could get caught up with that. That's precisely why we did it. You do not show up here to hear what you already know. You do not. This is life changing ministries. If you want to go to, you know, diaper filling ministries, there's enough of those around. And you can go to them. The whole goal is to provoke you to study. The whole goal is to get you to walk around your relationship with the Lord, to dig deeper into the Bible. And I know that you love our pastors and you shudder to think that a statement could be worded poorly. That shouldn't cause you distress at all. Not even a little bit. It should drive you to further study. And I'm kind of excited that it did. We're working on a pendulum swing. If for 2,000 years all that has been emphasized is God loves you so much, God loves you so much, he loves you so much, and that is not what the Bible story is actually about, can you see why we're trying to cut in on that unwholesome dance and see if we can shift the perspective slightly? I want to give you a note about metaphors and interpretations. Can we do our next slide? How many of you remember this from the book of Romans? At least I hope it will be there. It should say the Jew first and also the Greek. There we go. Get it, Nia. Check this out. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew and also for the Greek. See, that's not exclusionary. The fact that it says to the Jew first doesn't mean that the Greek is not also included. But it does mean that the Jew is first. How about in every passage you consider the Jew first and then you as the Greek also? How about that? Wouldn't that be awesome? See, nobody in here is saying that you are not the bride of Christ. What we're actually saying is you were not in view as the bride of Christ except in some mystical way for a couple millennia. It applied first to the Jew and also to the... Yeah, how, how about that? There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil. The Jew first, and also the Greek. Well, we kind of like that one, huh? <laughs> Let's hang on to the, nobody wants to challenge that one, huh? Yeah. How about this? In every passage, every metaphor, every image, you are safest looking at Israel first, and then also considering the Greek. We spent 57 days on this topic because we were trying to help reverse that. Can we be honest and say that prior to those 57 days, 
You did not consider Israel first in every metaphor. You did not consider Israel first with every scripture. You did not consider Israel first at all. Yeah, Paul was the one who was brave enough to raise his hand. My hope is that these last 57 days have helped you to see the extent to which the biblical gospel is Israel dependent and a greater appreciation for just how mysterious your inclusion is. I'm going to spend the rest of my time, yeah, the rest of my time going over a few things from Romans. I had the opportunity to uh, assist in teaching at the Arising Church, also with uh, Refuge City Ministries. If you've not been following their Romans teaching, I I hope you'll check it out. It's on YouTube and every other place that this generation gets everything from. And they are working through the book of Romans. They've done some things excellently. They've done some things that need to be improved. That's what a Bible study is. They've had some challenges from people in the congregation, challenges amongst themselves, and it is promoting study, which is the whole point, okay? We're not selling books, and we're not telling you that everything is perfect. We're we're letting you see our raw engagement with the text. The God's honest truth, by the way, if you want to hear about the book of Romans in a more comprehensive fashion, go there and look. And I taught for two hours on some things I'm briefly going to touch on. Because our sermon today is no exclusionary truth. But I want to do some things from the book of Romans to help you understand the point of our series. Can we say that for many of us, for way too long, we've been in the center of the story? Okay. Let's turn to Romans 1 with each other for just a second. You don't know how hard it was to teach an entire two-hour session on the book of Romans and not vape a singular time. I would have taught for four hours if they didn't have that rule in their sanctuary. Which does not bode well for you guys tonight. Romans 1.1. Greeting, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Where is the gospel announced? It's in the Tanakh. The gospel did not begin with the book of Matthew after that little New Testament divider you have between Malachi and Matthew. According to Paul, the gospel begins in the Tanakh. Can I tell you why? The gospel is not just the story that Jesus died for you as a Gentile. It, not, not even close. In fact, the gospel story actually begins in Genesis. It actually begins in Genesis in the garden. But that's just way too complex for people who only care about the part of the story that relates to them. Let's move to verse 3. Concerning his son, who is descended from David, according to the flesh. So the gospel announced in the Tanakh and given to Israel, it concerned Jesus. But who does Paul make it a point to open His letter saying he descended from an Israeli king. Yeah, that's interesting. And how about verse 4? And was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. So this gospel that's announced in the Tanakh beforehand concerned an Israeli king descended from another Israeli king who is also declared to be the son of God. Is that the way that you would have introduced the gospel story? But all of you love Paul. You believe he had it right, don't you? Then why do we do it differently? Well, that would be because we've experienced 2,000 years of imbalanced teaching. Yeah? Let's go to verse 5. Let's zero in on our point for tonight. Remember, Paul is a Jewish apostle. And he's writing this book with his companions. And I want you to see how they saw their mission as it relates to you Gentiles. Verse 5. Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. 
including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Yeah, let that sink in for a minute. In the first five verses, we've had a thoroughly Jewish introduction to the gospel, a thoroughly Jewishly rooted introduction to the gospel. And then Paul begins to declare that he wanted to bring about the obedience of faith from among Gentiles for the sake of God's name. Okay, well, God's name is announced in the Tanakh. We could start an entire fight tonight with a lot of hell. Okay, <laughs> see? <laughs> one, one says, his name is Yahweh. Another goes, no, 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 you got your vowel points wrong. In fact, all of that's wrong. It's Yehovah. Another goes, no, no, you should just say Yah. And, and, and on and on it goes. You know how you know his name? His character. Okay? Uh, you know his name by his character. I'm not saying the pronunciation is not important. I'm simply saying that God attached his name and his character to certain promises in the Tanakh. Did y'all learn that during those 57 days that God staked his name on the redemption of Israel? So Paul opens his letter making sure that you understand he is writing this letter so that from your trust in Messiah, your faith will flow in obedience to the things God staked his name on. That's the first five verses of Romans. Why are we doing this study? I don't know. Why did Paul write a letter to a church that he hadn't been to and start this way? Our salvation so often has been selfish. Our salvation has been about us and blessings for us and some tele-evangelist that would run off with your wife if you left him alone. The whole point of the, of the gospel is what God has staked his name to. And now that you trust him, there's an obedience that has to accompany that trust regarding what he staked his name on. Amen. That's how Romans opens. Do you think that sometimes if we looked at the beginning of a letter and the way the letter ended, we might have a better perspective on the letter? Yeah. Well, that was the first chapter. Chapter 16 is mostly salutations. So I want to back up to chapter 15 where he's winding down his teaching. Okay? As you get to chapter 15, my point from Romans 1 is the opening of Romans aims at bringing about your obedience of faith to the things God has already attached his own name to. Why did we do this series? We want an obedience coming from your faith to the things God attached his name to. Okay. When you were in second grade as a Sunday school kid or whatever, and you're like, I don't know, I'm just my callings to worship and love the Lord forever. And I, I don't mean to mock that, except I'm very intentionally mocking that. <laughs> yeah. When you stay that shallow forever, how will you participate in God's plan? You have no idea what it is. You know, what, what you're saying is I want to sit in the grandstand somewhere, enjoy the popcorn, and I didn't notice there was even a show or a progression of events. Okay, Romans 15, verse 15. I, I'm going to do it, Pastor. But on some points, I have written to you very boldly because I knew that you were not whiny, sniveling little babies that couldn't handle it. But on some points, I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God. You ready for it? So that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. You mean to tell me that in the beginning of his letter, he says, I'm writing this to you, Goyim, because I want there to be an obedience that accompanies your faith. And that obedience has to be for the sake of God's name what God has attached himself to. And at the end of the letter, he says, I just spent all of that ink and parchment and had my buddy write it down because I am aiming at your life being an acceptable sacrifice for what God wants to achieve. Okay, Paul is writing this letter so that we will know the plan of God and know our place in the plan of God so that we are not just boxing the air wildly and achieving nothing. Or maybe more to the point in modern terms, sitting on our salvation, growing our blessed assurance without regard to anything God wants done on the earth. Yeah. 
When we pray something like uh, the Our Father, you know, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. How many people say that around the globe? I mean, the whole Catholic community does. Do they have any idea who he promised the kingdom to or what that kingdom is like or what it takes to bring it about? What, why not? Because for a couple thousand years, we've not had Israel in the center of the story. We took a mere 57 days, just 57, and 17 messages to try to adjust your focal point so that you would see these things correctly. I think that was a fair thing to do, don't you? Yeah. The whole point is that you find out God's designed plan and play the particular role that he has for you to play in that redemptive plan. I mean, why does this church do mezuzah statements? Why do we have family banners? Why are we working to see what we're called to? This would be a little bit like understanding a tiny little sprocket inside of a transmission, but not knowing what a transmission does in the car. Okay? Ah, I just know my part. I just know. We'll grow up. Okay? This is life-changing ministries. What God has spoken to your family fits into a larger narrative. It fits into a larger whole. It allows you to see things like, if Israel is the target, why on earth are we going to Romania? Because that's the next part for us in his overall plan. Okay? That's what's at stake in this. Now that you have an idea about the beginning of Romans, and you have an idea of the ending of Romans, the beginning of Romans being that your faith should produce an obedience to the things God attached his name to. The ending of Romans being that your life, your whole life, become a sacrifice on behalf of what God wants to accomplish. Could we look at a few of the middle chapters? Romans 8 discusses many things. And, well, let me just read a verse from Romans 8. Is that okay? Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew. Just write Calvin in your Bible right there. It'll (laughs) screw you up for a lifetime. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of a son. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined... He also called, and those whom he called, he also justified, and those he justified, he also glorified. Do you know how many branches of theology have split off over this wording? If we considered that these words apply first to the Jew and then to the Greek, if we considered that, you know, we would not have these copious errors in every direction. Do you guys remember this slide, the patriarchs in Genesis? What was Paul thinking about when he wrote this? Well, could it be that Abraham is predestined to become a blessing to the whole planet and that God said that before he even had kids? Could that be what was on his mind? Could it, could it be that Isaac is the promised son who God called forth from barrenness to fulfill the promises of Israel? Do you think maybe that's what he had on his mind or was, was he planting tulips and counting petals? Yeah. Uh, Jacob is justified by his trust in Adonai and becomes Israel. How interesting that the order of the patriarchs is the order that he phrased his sentence. Joseph is rejected by his brothers, but glorified by God as their savior and the savior. What is Romans 8 about? It's about the predestiny of the nation of Israel to be exactly what God said they are to be. That's what Romans 8 is about. So if the beginning of the book is about your obedience flowing from faith, the end of the book is about making your life a sacrifice on behalf of what God wants to accomplish. Why is he doing this? He's telling you right in the middle of the book what it is God wants to accomplish. Isn't that worth studying for 57 days? Yeah, I would say that's worth studying for 57 days. Look, how how about Romans 9? Is it okay if we do Romans 9? Are y'all bored already? uh, Kelsey, are you doing all right? Yeah, well, if she's doing all right, we'll move forward. Okay, Romans 9. What does Romans 9 concern? Romans 9 concerns the ethics of God's sovereign choice of the nation of Israel. In fact, the whole chapter is dedicated 
to making you understand that this is a matter of God's sovereignty. It's that, that God wanted this to occur and that who are you to talk back to him about it? It's simply how he chose to organize his plan. Okay. How many of you are married in here? Okay. <laughs> then definitely do not answer me out loud. Ha, have you ever been working on something? I don't know, a construction project, or maybe you're bent forward over a car and you're working on it, and the person you love most in the world walks up, hand on hip, and goes, why'd you do it that way? Why, why, why don't you do that? <laughs> Romans 9. <laughs> Romans 9, 10. And not only so, but also when Rebecca had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, Though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue. Not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. How many crazy thoughts have come out of this? Of course, if you put Israel in the center of it, then Jacob is an entire nation. Esau is an entire nation. Israel and Edom. And the entire chapter has to do with national destinies and doesn't refer to individuals at all. Do you remember this slide called National Destinies? Romans 9, 7, Abraham and Isaac are mentioned, and it's through Isaac that the offspring would be reckoned. In Romans 9, 10, Esau and Jacob are mentioned, but they are the heads of two nations. The other guy mentioned in the chapter is Pharaoh. Of course, he's the head of Egypt, and he was raised up for the sole purpose of God displaying his power uh, to protect Israel since he said he would save them. See, what you learn from Romans 9 in the overall scheme of the book is it's not enough for you to have faith in certain facts about Jesus. Well, I believed he died. I believed he was resurrected. I believe he ascended. I believed he had blonde hair and blue eyes. It, those facts, they, they're almost irrelevant. Every demon in hell knows those facts are true. It is about having the kind of faith that Jesus had. Uh, it's about displaying trust in him in your actions. Well, Jesus is going to accomplish something. He's going to accomplish Romans 8, the destiny of Israel. He's going to accomplish something. Romans 9, the destiny of Israel in relation to other nations. In fact, can we look at what Romans 10 is about? Y'all doing okay? Yeah. Romans 10. Romans 10 concerns Jesus as the ultimate aim of the Torah, that, of course, was given to Israel. Neil, you're going to have to skip. Oh, you are amazing, girl. Where you at, Ubong? Where you at, Ubong? Oh, okay, I just want to know if you're here. <laughs> Telos. Romans 10.4. For Christ is the end of the law. Good, because we don't need any of that Jewish stuff, right? For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Uh, what an unfortunate translation. Romans 10.4, Christ is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Or CJB, for the goal at which the Torah aims is Messiah who offers righteousness to everyone who trusts. Why is Paul talking about the very culmination or full extent or goal of the law given to Israel being expressed in Christ? It's not so that Gentile readers who are not in view for most of the biblical narrative could come along and go, good, then we don't have to pay any attention to 39 books of the Bible. It was so that you would understand that the word that became flesh was the law of God that became flesh. That law was given to Israel and no other nation. Jesus appeared to the lost sheep of Israel. It was first for the Jew and also and those two things are not exclusionary from one another. In fact, the gospel is inclusive, not exclusionary. Okay? Are you all following me so far? Yeah. You're pretty sure that you're in Christ and you're not sure why we would challenge you about a bride of Christ statement. or some. We're challenging you so that... Is anybody else getting married in the world 
on uh, New Year's Eve? Do you think somewhere somebody is? Okay, so there's another bride somewhere. But when we start talking about the wedding on New Year's Eve, who are we obviously talking about? That doesn't exclude the fact that there may be another wedding somewhere. This is just what we have in view. We're trying to get you to understand the primary way to view the Bible is Israel first and also a Greek. Did we achieve that? Okay. Then why don't we move to Romans 11? Is that okay? I don't want to recap everything here. I did this for a couple hours and at great length at a rising. And... Um, it's recorded for you if you want to see that. Listen to it. So good. What I want to do is put an exclamation point on why we have been covering what we have and why it felt important for us to do it. In Romans 11, look at verse 25. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery. That's quite a thing to say 11 chapters into a book. Yeah? Yeah. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. Yeah. How, let me just keep reading. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as regards election... They are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Who has ever heard the verse, the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable, applied to somebody other than Israel? Raise your hand if you. Yeah. It's usually some chick that can sing, and then you find out she's a lesbian, and uh, you're, you're really surprised that she can still sing, and somebody goes, I don't know, she's called to God, and the gifts of calling are irrevocable. She's in sin, but she can still sing. This has nothing to do with individuals. Okay? Romans opens with one clear call. There must be obedient actions flowing from your faith in regard to what God's plan is. Romans closes with a clear call. Your life must become an acceptable offering for what God wants to accomplish. Romans 8 lays out that Israel is predestined. Romans 9 discusses the ethics of him choosing this in such a sovereign way. Romans 10 shows that everything that was ever given to Israel was both to lead up to Christ and Christ is the living, breathing, walking example of. Romans 11 is about the salvation of Israel. Well, we've been through Deuteronomy together, and I'm not going to walk through that. I'm creeping up on an hour with you. But everything that Paul says in Romans 11... Is found in Deuteronomy. You know that Deuteronomy says Israel is God's chosen inheritance. You know that, right? You can read Deuteronomy 32.8 in your own time. Is that exclusionary though? They're the only nation that he said was his inheritance, but then the broader statement and the whole earth is mine kind of covers the rest of us, doesn't it? It's just that they were named, you were not named. So if you put Israel in the center of everything first and then consider how it applies to a Greek, you'll be on good footing. Okay? You know that Deuteronomy 32 predicts a hardening and uh, a hardening in part on Israel's uh, part. And Deuteronomy 32 says that God would provoke them with a foolish nation. There we go. We were named. Aren't you happy? We, we were named. God foresaw the Biden administration and we're there. Deuteronomy 32 closes with God saving Israel. This is the subject matter that Paul wrote Romans 11 from. So let's do this then. Let's read Romans 11, 13 through 15. Now I am speaking to you Gentiles. Finally, it's about us. Now I'm speaking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. So what is his point? When it is about you, 
It's about you so that you can be obedient from your faith, make your life sacrificial to accomplish for Israel what God staked his name on. That's the point. That's the point of everything that we were doing. And I'm glad that we ruffled your feathers. I'm glad that I got phone calls. I'm glad that there were texts. I'm glad that we got to sit together and we studied more. We thought about the best ways to say things. We didn't always achieve it. To free myself from that tonight, I've made no concerted effort to be careful how I say things. <laughs> Look, God wants you to be used in a way that furthers his plan. Amen. That's, that's, that's what he wants, okay? So let's do this then. If that's Romans 11, what is Romans 12? I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. This is Paul's appeal to you, to have a sacrificial attitude towards the objectives of God. Can we say that Christianity needs that? Even the way we say this, I just need to know God's will for me. Maybe if you were praying about God's will for others, the Jew first, and also the Greek, you would have a more profound experience with the Lord. But as long as it stays me-centric, then it's going to stay shallow for a very long time. So we spent 57 days and 17 sermons helping you with that because after all, this is life-changing ministries. In the view of Romans 1, Romans 15, and then the middle of the book, Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. Have you been shown mercy? Was it unexpected, unforecasted, undeclared mercy? And you were shown it. So shouldn't you want mercy for the nation that he did forecast, he did declare, and he did name? That's what we're after, my friends. In fact, you have to offer your body as a living sacrifice. Jesus laid down his life for the nation of Israel. We as Gentiles are called to walk as Jesus walked in everything that that means. How can we imitate him and walk in the footsteps of the master and not have this attitude? Paul wrote this letter for this purpose. Okay. Why do we do it? We do it out of reverence for God's name, which is the first thing that Paul appealed to. Okay. He is called to minister to Gentiles so that from their faith will flow obedience for the sake of God's name. It's because of reverence for God's name, not an individual that you meet, okay? Uh, otherwise, all we have to do is go to Ancestry.com and, you know, get a target list. But it's out of reverence for God's name that we do these things. Do you reverence God's name? So we do this out of reverence for God's name, and we do this in view of the mercy that was shown to us. Now, we could keep going with this. But I'm at 58 minutes, so I do want to bring this to a close. Romans 16 says something. For your obedience is known to all. I'm going to brag on you, LCM, and I'm going to do it in front of your visiting brothers. There are people that question the sanity of LCM. There are people that question the methods of LCM. I don't believe that there are serious Christians that question the obedience of LCM. Okay. Uh, I think our reputation is well-deserved. It's holiness or die trying, right? That's, that's who we are. What we're doing is expanding your understanding of God's plan. So for your obedience is known to all so that I rejoice over you. Can I tell you it's a happy day for me to come home? Uh, all of the churches are my family. They're pastored by men that I consider my sons. I love them all, but it is a happy day to come home here. And it made me extremely happy to hear that you were in turmoil over some things. <laughs> because it meant that you were studying. Yeah. 
It meant that the pastors were pushing. It meant that we were not satisfied with the status quo. So that I rejoice over you. But I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. What was the title of this message? I've forgotten. God's sovereign choice of Israel does not exclude you. But your exclusion of Israel could. Why are we talking about the things we're talking about? How could your life have obedience flowing from faith and your life become an sa acceptable sacrifice without reference to what God wants done on the earth? That's why we're covering these things. These 57 days have been an, in an effort for you to know your place in the plan so that you can crush Satan under your feet. That's, that's what they've been about. And uh, we keep saying 57 days, but this ministry has been Israel-centric since day one. We're just growing in that. A core fundamental value of this ministry is favor to Israel. Uh, looking up at Miss Lindsay, I remember when she walked in the church the first time. She's like, are y'all Jews? <laughs> like, obviously, you know. We want you to know God's plan so you can take seriously your role in that plan. Our final scripture and worship team, you can walk up here. I don't know what we're going to do yet. I haven't decided, but I want to read something to you. This is Psalm 33. Look, an hour and one minute, minute message for me is like 25% of norm. Y'all are to be happy about this. Psalm 33:10. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the people. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people whom he has chosen as his heritage. God has one redemptive plan, but he has plans for each one of you to play a part in his redemptive plan. Can somebody say that's an extraordinary honor? That's an extraordinary privilege. It's not, it's not our place to question why he chose to single out a particular nation. Although Deuteronomy 4 tells you why, but it's not our place. It's not our place to go, yeah, but what about? It's our place to understand his plan and ask how we can fit into it. If you have a sincerely God-given mezuzah, if you have a sincerely God-given family banner, if you have a sincere and active relationship with the word, I promise the things he's already told you fit into this plan, and it's your job to figure out how. It's your job to go, okay, now Romania makes sense because we have to start somewhere. Our goal has not changed, and this is where God has said. Now Italy makes sense. Those things don't make sense if you don't understand the larger plan. I want you to know your place in God's plan. It'll keep you from being insecure. It'll keep you from being led off into error. It will keep you from being selfishly centered or selfishly ambitious. You will just want to make your life an acceptable offering before the king. Now, I'm not going to go through what the sacrifice of a fool is. Ecclesiastes teaches it. You don't get to offer just anything you want. Because then he's not your Lord. He designs the sacrifice for you. And it has to be in reference to what he wants to accomplish on the earth. Anybody in here like a particular state? Like just... If you, if you could move to a state based purely on natural reasons. You got one in mind? You don't get to choose that, though. He determines where you live, where you work. He does this because he has a plan. Okay? And if you have a, a dream job, yeah, but you don't get to decide those things. He decides, and it's always in reference 
to his larger redemptive plan, which is unchanging. We taught this series so you would know your, or you would know God's plan and begin to figure out your place in it. Would you please stand to your feet? We're going to have an extraordinary time at a bonfire. For more than three decades, we've been gathering in seeking God as we ushered into a new orbital cycle. And if you look back through those, he's always been pushing us in certain directions. He's always breathing life into us for what is ahead. It's because he has a plan. And we're discovering our place in it. And he's going to keep breathing his revelation into us. You want to hear from God? You, you want to be close to him? Start to be concerned with the things that he's concerned about. Okay? This church was not formed as a bless me group. In God's name, it will never become a bless me group. Our sole goal is to push you to the place where you have to refigure life. We try to do it every single week and ask the Lord, am I really standing in your plan in the way that you want? Or have I settled for something lesser? If you do this regularly, he will start to solidify your identity. Your friendship with him will grow and he will share his secrets with you. I wish that we all learned simply from hearing a perfect teaching. We don't. You learn from being challenged. You learn from points of disagreement. You learn from getting angry enough to open your Bible and prove somebody wrong and find out you were wrong. That's, that's how we learn. Be glad that you have pastors who will do that for you because most of them are just pansies who want to be liked. And you have men here that will dig in the Word, be humble, tell you when they made mistakes, and challenge you to your face. Some of us even like it. That's how a family grows. Life-changing ministries exist for your growth. Period. That's, that's it. Because ministries come out of this room. In fact, we're about to see our seventh series of birthing of ministers. We'll talk to you about that at the bonfire. Seven times we've been through what we're doing right now. We, we want you to find your place in God's plan. Do you want that? Yes. We're going to pray. I'm not going to make some weird emotional appeal at the altar. I'm staring at people that I know. I know your lives. What, what I'm going to ask you to do, those of you that couldn't help it, check your watch, you're thinking about other things, break yourself free from the rut of religion that happens even to us. Break yourself free from the we stand at this time, we sit at this time, we just, and take a moment while we worship and ask the Lord to direct your footsteps in his plan. I can promise you 30 years from now, you won't regret these few minutes. I can promise you that. And you can ask me how I know. If you take this seriously, he will ordain for you a path. He will show it to you. You will delight in it, and He will delight in you. Do you want that? Then let's take a moment and do that, okay? Father, may you protect us from what we think we know. Lord, may you enliven us to what we still need to know. Lord, break off of us our well-worn paths. Break off of us the tradition that we've clung to that is so often wrong and breathe into us, mighty God, sincere, real direction for our lives. We want to be an acceptable sacrifice in your work. We want obedient actions that flow from faith. So Lord, we're asking you to strip away what we thought we knew and reveal to us what we need to know tonight.